Hello and welcome to everyone. This is our Travel Dreaming series with Mark Twain Library. I know we are just coming in, so we're going to wait a minute or so while people are logging in. If you are new to the Mark Twain Library, we welcome you. Welcome today to uh, one of our many programs that we run here out of Reading, Connecticut. Um, this is our Travel Dreaming series. And if you don't know about the jewel of the town, which is the Mark Twain Library, we do encourage you to log on, learn a bit more about this private nonprofit entity, and to come join many of our programs that we offer throughout the weeks and months ahead. Uh, my name is Angela Caius, and I am happily a member of the Libraries of Delt programming team. So as we have people joining us today, we welcome you and we are here in case you are wondering where you are to unlock the secrets of the Marais in Paris. As we start off, I'm just gonna mention a few housekeeping notes. So this program is being recorded. So if you have to get up real quick or if you are so excited and want to watch again or share with friends, you can view this a little later at the YouTube page for the Mark Twain Library. Similarly, I'm sure you'll be bursting with questions as our speaker here is not only engaging, but has a wealth of knowledge about Paris and the area we're talking through. If you do have those questions, please use the chat function or the question and answer function on the Zoom and ask those questions, but do give us your first name so we can answer you personally. We will probably go through the whole conversation first and then take questions at the end. So feel free to jot down those questions anytime they come through. One last note while we're getting rolling here and everyone's coming in, again, thank you for joining us, is I was wondering, find that chat function on your screen by looking at the very lower corner, so the lower middle panel on your screen, and do tell us a little about yourself. Where were you going the last time you were on an airplane? We certainly know that may not have been for quite a while for many of us. I know for me it was February of 2020, um, but please let us know, where were you going? Where were you going the last time you were traveling away somewhere on an airplane? Oh, and very excited. We have a whole group of people coming in. Mexico, Paris, of course. Well, we're very excited to know Rhonda knows a little about Paris or she did not get to go and will be coming back with us. London, Palm Springs, this is amazing. Maine, Spain, Yellowstone. Oh, Italy, Chicago, Cambodia, Vietnam, Hong Kong. That sounds amazing. Portugal, oh, lots of Francophiles here. I'm really excited. Connecticut, St. Barts, Asheville, South Carolina. Well done. Thank you, Mr. Stanley, because my family's from Greenville, South Carolina, Paris, and Provence. Oh, this is amazing. So we're very excited to have such an engaged audience. We know for sure that you can use the chat function. And so we do encourage you throughout the conversation if you have any questions. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen by doing a little bit of this and get going onto our section. And officially welcome you all to this most wonderful conversation this afternoon. It is snowing here in Reading for anybody who's here with us in Connecticut. It is 8 p.m. for us in Paris. So we have a very grateful and thank you to Richard Nahum for joining us today. Just a little bit about our series. This is the Travel Dreaming series with Mark Twain Library, and we have taken on Paris today. Very excited to learn about the streets of Paris. But just before we get into it, let me explain. Uh, my name is Angela Caius. I'm thrilled to be a resident, a local, a member of the Mark Twain Library, but also an owner of a travel company, which has allowed me to bring some of my personal friends and connections to these conversations and share with you some of the reasons why I love to go to Paris. While we're looking at where we're going today, let's take a minute and just orientate ourselves. For those of you who have been to Paris before, this map will look really familiar. For those of you who may not have traveled, we are going to be talking about these, well, sections of both of these two areas. And I'll let Richard explain why perhaps we go over two areas that's called the Marais. But one of the things you may know is you may know very well the Eiffel Tower, the Arc de Triomphe, the Champs-Élysées, you may have been to the Louvre. 
Some people have been to the Mirai before and some people are going to discover it for the very first time today. So we welcome you to that conversation. Likewise, here's a little flavor of what this delightful historic area of Paris has in store for us. And for many of you, and I know some of my friends have reached out to me, have said, this is one of my favorite parts of Paris and a part that we would love to share. So let me take a moment now and introduce our speaker. As mentioned, my name is Angela, and one of the things I get to do for business is research. And in the middle of researching in 2019, all those inner places in Paris, I was delightfully introduced to Richard. Richard is not only a guide, a former chef, a local resident in Paris, but he's also a travel writer and a wealth of knowledge. Sometimes you meet people that just click, just click with you and between the food that we shared and the local cafes, and I happen to be a history buff, we just clicked. And I hope today that you enjoy his company as much as I do. Over to you, Richard, tell us some more about what we're going to do and learn today. Bonjour, or for me, it's bonsoir because it's eight o'clock at night. Uh, there I am, okay. And so uh, I'm very excited to be with everybody today. Uh, you're in snowy Connecticut. I'm in rainy Paris today. And um, so a little bit more about myself. So as Angela said, I'm a travel writer. I also write a popular blog called I Prefer Paris, E-Y-E, Prefer Paris. And I post three times a week about fun and interesting things to do in Paris, uh, culture, history, uh, food, theater, shopping, just lots of other things. And of course, um, I do these uh, private tours of, of Paris. And again, that's how I met Angela in 2019. We did a tour of the Marais. And so that was pretty great. And so uh, what we're gonna do today, uh, tonight, <laughs> see it's nighttime here for me, is we're gonna do this really fun tour of the Marais. I'm gonna show you, uh, I'm gonna tell you some history of the Marais. I'm gonna show you some of the beautiful architecture. I'm gonna share some of my wonderful um, food shops and a special uh, boulangerie or bakery with you and a couple of other uh, neat things. So I don't wanna give it all away. So, um, all righty. So, uh, and like Angela said, I'd be more than happy to um, answer your questions later on in the, in the chat. So I am now going to go to, uh, I'm also, this is going to be a slideshow too. So these are all my own photos that I took uh, just in particular for this tour uh, today. And so uh, just one second, and I'm going to just put it full screen here. Just one second, view and full screen mode. And voila, as we say in French. Alrighty, so uh, the Marais means, um, Marais actually means marshland in French. So we're, we're actually on a swamp here. And it's one of the oldest areas in Paris, but also one of the most newly developed areas in Paris. And it's actually a very large area. So it covers- Richard, I uh, may have to just interrupt you for one second to sure. let you know your screen turned black. So maybe it's Ooh. ahead or behind of the picture you'd like to show. Oh, that's weird. Um, one second, let me, oh, that's weird. Because well, we I- We are all imagining. Black that? is the new in color folks, but no, nah. we're going to go to the Marais today. Okay, Ho hold on one second. Let me, hmm. one second, let me see. One second, sorry. Okay, you still can't see me. Uh, we okay. can see you, but we just can see a black screen on your share. Okay, so you're not seeing the slideshow. Correct. Okay. Uh, oh, that's weird. Okay, hold on. On uh, a good note, folks are coming here from all over the world. Okay. And I have to say, we have someone who's going back to Paris. We're going Budapest, Berlin, right. Ireland. I'm so excited to see everybody being such a oh, great traveler today. No. We appreciate you all being here and working through technical difficulties as always happens. Right. Live shows, live shows go. Okay, just one second, sorry. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. See, it's that one second. I can put stop share here. Okay. Let me try this one more time. All right. Share screen. 
And bless Rhonda, she's so excited to share it with us. Welcome to the world of Zoom meetings. Certainly over the past year, I'm sure everyone here has had okay. an opportunity I... to see. You are good to go now, Richard. It's the perfect screen. Okay, good. And you can see me now? Correct. Okay, good. Okay, good. All right, perfect. All righty, so, um, so I was saying the Marais, it means marshland. So we're basically on a swamp here. And it's one of the oldest areas in Paris, yet one of the most newly developed areas. And it actually co covers a very large area of Paris. So it, it, if, if any of you have been here, you know that there's 20 different neighborhoods in Paris and they're called arrondissements. And the Marais covers two arrondissements. It covers the third and the fourth arrondissement. So it's very large. So it starts sort of at the um, actually at the islands of the Ile Saint-Louis and the Ile des Cité, which is the fourth arrondissement and goes north maybe about three quarters of a mile. So it's fairly large in size. And so now starting in the early 600s, the swamp was um, drained and the land was given to the monks. And we know monks were pretty industrious. So they said, okay, we have all this land, we need to do something with it. And they realized it was really good for growing things. Um, so the soil. And so they planted vegetable gardens and small farms all in the area. And for about 700 years, this was mostly farmland. Now this house that you're seeing in front of you, this is one of the oldest houses in Paris. So this was built in 1327, and it is definitely the oldest building here in the Marais. And so now these kinds of houses were called half timber houses. So you see there's the wood there, and then you see this is almost like a cement or a plaster. Now, originally what was there was a mixture of stones, twigs, and horse manure. Now you're probably going, ugh, that's horrible. But actually it acted as a cement to keep that building together for almost 700 years. And in the early 1500s, they covered it with plaster because these buildings were really flammable. And so for hundreds of years, it was under this plaster. It sort of looked a little bit like the building next door here. And so, and in the mid 60s, they started to do all this restoration work in the Marais and they discovered what was underneath the plaster. So they um, renovated it. And now these are actual apartments and these are very small. You can see they don't go that far back. And they're a whole big whopping 200 square feet. <laughs> And as one of my clients once said, who had a big house said, why well, that is the size of my shoe closet back home, 200 square feet. But anyway, Pat Parisians do live in very small spaces. And so the, uh, and then in the late 1500s, um, the, excuse me one second, I'm trying to go to the next slide here. Whoops, uh, sorry guys, oh, there we go, okay. Uh, then starting in the late 1500s, about 1575, the royalty and the aristocracy started to uh, build their palaces and their mansions in the Marais because there was still a lot of empty land. So for about a 125 year period from about 1575 to um, 1700, they built over 250 of these gorgeous mansions. And luckily about three quarters of them are still standing in the Marais today. And now we're gonna do a little tour of these mansions and, and also tell you about the architecture of them. So this is uh, one of the most beautiful mansions in the area. And they all had certain um, common architectural details. So they were usually made out, of, made out of limestone because limestone was quarried right on, underneath the city. So they could literally just go underneath the streets of Paris and take the limestone. And then they also had, you see this head here. So this has a bunch of heads here, these were, they were like masks and these particular, they were decorative, but these particular ones, a little hard to see, but they have these big bulging eyes and those were to ward off evil spirits. And then this was the main door. So this was this huge wood door and believe it or not, this is the original door from the 1600s. So this mansion was built in 1657. And so these are the original doors. And when they open, um, there's a big cobblestone courtyard uh, where the horses and carriages enter. And then we're gonna go, and now this is a little bit wider view of the mansion. And then usually the, you see the second floor there, they had these be beautiful iron balconies, which is also very common, even in the later buildings of Paris. And see these, these are very tall windows here. 
So usually the way these mansions were structured, the tallest windows were on the second floor. These would have been the living room, the, um, the entertainment rooms, uh, dining room, library, uh, media room. Wait, they didn't have a media room in those days. And then the third floor would have been lower ceilings. And then the top floor would have been these dormers for the servants quarters. And, uh, and then the other common thing was, they, uh, again, here's one of these masks. You can get a little bit, bit of a close-up of it, the big eyes. And then a lot of times they had this kind of leaf decoration. Um, that was another very common thing. Sorry. And so now I have a very juicy story about this mansion. Now it's a, it's a little bit racy. I just want to warn you. And so, um, so this now in those days, a large private home was called a hotel. And, um, and then the owner's name would follow the word hotel. So this was called the Hotel de Bouvet because Pierre Bouvet was the owner. So now don't make the mistake of thinking this is a Marriott or a big hotel. You can't check in. It's not on TripAdvisor. Uh, but anyway, so Pierre Bouvet was the owner and we're going to talk about his wife, Catherine. And we're going to use her maiden name to protect her husband's good name in this story. So Catherine Bellier was the lady in waiting to Queen Anne of Austria. Now, if you don't know what a lady in waiting is, I'll tell you, she was more or less like a personal assistant. So she probably would have um, been arranging uh, the queen's wardrobe, her social schedule, arranging all the servants. So you might wonder why a servant like her would live in a big palace like this. Um, the queen would usually live in a palace like this and a servant like her would um, live in one of these tiny rooms. So this is how the maid got the big house. So her boss, Queen Anne of Austria, and uh, her boss is Queen Anne of Austria and King Louis XIII. It took them 24 years to have a child. Now, in any time in history, that is a really long time to have a child, but especially in those days for two reasons. One is um, they usually, um, one is they didn't live so long. So people maybe lived till 50 or 55. So 24 years would have been half their life. And two, there was always pressure on the royals to have heirs quickly to continue the throne. So after 25, tw after lots of heartache, three miscarriages, all this waiting, um, and 24 years, they finally had a child. Of course, they were happy and excited, but they were also relieved because they had a son. Uh, if they would have had a daughter, they would have been a lot of hot water because they went to had a king to continue the throne. So they're happy, relieved. Um, they're happily raising their son, and when he was 14, they were already grooming him to be king and to get married, because they usually got married, the royals usually got married very young, somewhere between 16 and 18. So at age 14, they said, okay, we're trying to be good, responsible parents, and bring up our child well, and he has these two life-changing events, and how do we prepare them for these events? So one of the things they said was, well, we don't want it to follow in our footsteps and take 24 years to have a child. We don't want him to go through those pains like we did. So we think somebody should teach him what to do in that department uh, before he gets married. So obviously they needed a teacher <laughs> and they went in-house and they chose the maid. Now, a very obvious reason was that uh, the maid was someone that the prince knew they weren't gonna bring in some stranger, but we have two other theories or reasons why we think they chose her. So one is, she had a nickname. It was One-Eyed Catherine. So she had this lazy eye that kind of went this way and the other eye went that way. And let's just say she was never going to be on the cover of Vogue magazine. And two, she was the very advanced age of 39. So in those days, if you only lived till 55 or 60, 40 was the new 60. So they figured, okay, he's not going to fall in love with her because she's young and beautiful, because she's neither of those. And two, less chance of pregnancy at the advanced age of 40. So they choose the maid, she starts her job, and uh, she realizes that her pupil may have some learning difficulties, and it takes her two years to train him. But uh, when the prince was 18, he became King Louis XIV and had six children and 30, about 35 illegitimate children. So her job, I think, more than paid off. So the reward for this job, this job well done, was the limestone to build this mansion and also a yearly salary or dowry so she could keep the mansion. 
And uh, like I said, they did a lot of restoration work in the Marais in the 1960s, and many of these hotels or these mansions were either derelict, abandoned, in terrible shape, and the city, city would come in and lease or buy them, and they would turn them into government offices. So today, uh, this building is a court of appeals. Now, the uh, next mansion, this is another beauty, look at how gorgeous this one is. Um, you can see it says Hotel de Sully. So this was the, the owner was the Duke of Sully, who um, was a finance minister under King Henry IV in the early to mid 1600s. And again, you could see the beautiful limestone. Uh, you can see all these uh, figures and uh, statues on here, very, very handsome. And then, uh, so this is the front courtyard. And then look at this neat door handle, see? Uh, so there's serpents on there. And I do this feature on my blog called the door of the month. And every month I take a picture of a beautiful door. So anyway, this is one of my doors of the month. And then we're gonna go here. Now this is the first courtyard here. And again, this is where the horses and carriages would come in. And on the right there, see there, those archways, those were the horse stables. And now there's also um, some more beautiful statues here. And these statues have meaning. So these two, these represent two of the four seasons. So the, um, this one on the left is the grape harvest for fall, although she might be a little chilly in, uh, in a Paris fall. And this is old man winter on the right who's wearing a toga, although he is definitely gonna need a um, heavy winter coat um, excuse me, <laughs> a heavy winter coat because it's going to get freezing here tomorrow. And so, and then you can also see again, these uh, leaf ornamentation on the side there, another female mask down there. And then these two statues, there's two here. And then the next two, these represent the elements. So that's air, land, I believe that's fire on the right. And the last one with the vase is water. And then uh, here, this is, and then you walk through to the garden. Isn't that gorgeous? And this is about a five minute walk from my house. So there's this beautiful garden that's uh, really hidden. And if you didn't know it was there, you, you would just walk right by it. So, that, uh, so that's the garden there, their private garden. And this is kind of what they call a typical formal French garden. So they have these box hedges and you see they're manicured and sculpted. And then that building there was also part of the property. And uh, so these doors here, that would have been what they called an orangery. Now you might've heard that term before. And if you don't know what an orangery is, it was a hothouse or a greenhouse where they would store their citrus plants. So they would put their orange and lemon trees in these big planters or these pots, they would put them in there in the winter so they wouldn't freeze. And then they would bring them out in the spring and summer to bloom. And then next, uh, now that's the back side of the match. And again, really beautiful, three stories made out of limestone. And then on the left there, that's um, spring and then that's summer. Now, um, now this is also open to the public, which was great. So sometimes uh, you see that lady having her, whatever, her lunch there. I sometimes come in here myself uh, when it's a nice day out and have lunch. Now there's a doorway from this mansion uh, all the way in the back and if you didn't know it was there, it leads to something even more spectacular. So we're gonna go down here, you go through that door and hold on, voila, that is the called the Place des Vosges. And this is the oldest or first square of Paris. So this was built, so it's like four arcades that go around a square here. And in a minute, I'll show you the rest of it. And then, um, and again, these were these, uh, uh, beautiful homes here. Isn't that, isn't that fabulous? This is one of the top restaurants in Paris and um, it's called uh, La Amboise and uh, a bowl of soup will set you back about 80 euros. <laughs> anyway, back to the history of the Place de Vosges. So like I said, it was the first public square of Paris built between 1605 and 1612 under the reign of King Henry IV. So besides being the first square of Paris, a couple of other firsts. So this is one of the first times they use brick face. So pretty much all the buildings we saw before and mostly in the Marais, they're made out of limestone. So this was one of the first uses of brick. Now, also it was the first sign that there was any kind of uniform architecture. So pretty much every house is the same and it's, they're connected. And so this was, um, so this would have been one unit, as they say in real estate talk. And uh, so it's uh, three stories. And then again, you have the main floor of the archways there. And it goes four windows across. 
And this would have been the home of a royal or aristocratic family. And this one has a bell tower on it. And so uh, now today these are apartments because it would be prohibitively expensive to own, own a whole um, house like this. And then uh, now you see this uh, photo, you see how one building is taller there, you see that? So there was two of these, there's one on this side and one on the other side of the square. And um, these were built for the king and the queen. Now, the reason why, even though they had never officially lived in them, they were built for them. And the reason why they're taller is because even in real estate, the commoners had to be lower than the, the king and the queen. And so this is a very lively square. And then uh, see, and then this is the garden part. So this is called Louis the 13th Park that's in the center of the square there. And uh, so this is again, a very typical formal French garden. Uh, so again, manic very manicure, there's no flowers. These are these uh, typical, what they call topiaries, they're pointed and then they have these beautiful fountains. And again, it's all symmetrical. It's the same on all four sides. And then these trees here, these very tall trees, these are called um, horse chestnut trees. And uh, in about, uh, about three months in April, these two months in April, these will start to flower really beautifully. They get these very pretty pink and white flowers that kind of look like uh, hyacinths a little bit. And then look at how pretty. And then this is in the summer, which is really cool because you see the trees. So you're gonna go back a second. You see how on the sides there, you see there's this whole alleyway of trees. So in the summer, they fill in and it creates this beautiful um, sort of pathway or alleyway of trees. And also it's practical because they put the benches underneath. So that is the beautiful Place des Vosges. And then uh, now this is called the um, Carnavalet. And this is the um, main courtyard. And this is actually, it was a mansion from the 1600s and a, uh, a female, a very famous female in French history lived here. That's, that's Louis XIV there. So Madame Sevigny, you might have heard of her before, and she was one of the uh, most foremost letter writers of France. And so uh, she came from royalty. She uh, grew up in the Place de Vosges, just around the corner, and then she married and lived in this beautiful mansion. And at one point, uh, when she was away from her daughter and her friends, uh, she would write letters to them. And she really wrote beautifully, although sometimes if she was a little goss gossipy, you know, maybe like a um, 17th century blogger. <laughs> and anyway, uh, her letters are, um, she wrote over a thousand letters and they're um, printed and you can find them uh, translated into English at any, usually any kind of French American bookstore. Now, the, uh, now this is another beauty. Now this one's a little bit different in, in the terms of the architecture. So this was built in 1509. So the style's a little bit different. This is what they call a late medieval building. And then you see the garden here. Um, again, this is a um, very uh, manicured garden. And then where the box hedges are, these are much lower. They put um, flowers in between here. So that is, uh, and today this is a, textile museum and library. So, um, and the other thing too, is that when the flowers are here, um, they used to call this an embroidery garden. And the reason for that is, is that if you look from the window here and you look down, it looked like embroidery because the color of the flowers mixed with the green looked like an embroidery. Okay, so next, ah, so these are cool. These are our water fountains. So even our water fountains are beautiful in Paris. Look at those gorgeous goddesses holding up this um, water fountain. Now it's a little hard to see, but there's a steady stream here that goes uh, of water down here. And these actually have a very interesting history to them. So these are called Wallace fountains and they're named after Richard Wallace, who was actually an Englishman who spent a lot of time in Paris in the mid to late 1800s. And he was very wealthy. And so he's also a philanthropist and gave his money to good causes. So in 1870, um, 1871, sorry, um, there was no public drinking fountains or public water in Paris. All the public ducts for water had been destroyed during yet another revolution. So it was very difficult to find fresh water. It was as expensive or more expensive than alcohol. So Richard Wallace said, well, that's not a good thing. We're gonna have a town of winos and alcoholics here. We need some public water. So he designed these beautiful fountains himself. 
and he donated 50 of them to the city and they were so popular and so used that the city um, bought another 35 of them. So there's 85 of these Wallace fountains still operating all over Paris. So uh, now I am gonna take you, now I hope everybody had a good lunch because the next group of photo might make you hungry. So um, now I'm gonna take you, this is um, a boulangerie and you know the amazing French pastries. And so this one is in my neighborhood and they won a special prize here. So you see where it says the number two there, they won the prize for the second best baguette in Paris in 2014. Now, if you win the number one prize, it's even more special because um, you get a contract to supply the president's palace with bread for a year. So the president, his wife, his international guests are all eating your bread, and this is publicized everywhere. So it's in all the newspapers, websites, blogs. Um, and so the, sometimes these uh, little bakeries become uh, famous overnight or they get kind of overwhelmed. And so um, now I'm gonna show you, these are some of the wonderful pastries. So that's obviously a raspberry tart. This is called an opera cake, which is layers of chocolate and coffee. And then this is called a baba a rum. So it's a rum soaked uh, like sponge cake. And then they give you a little vial of rum there in case you didn't have enough rum there. And then we're gonna go here. And then these are um, like a pound cake or they're called a financier and they have uh, different flavors. I believe that's raspberry, strawberry, um, and then look at the bread. Those are the famous baguettes. So, and then some more here, um, look at these. So they use a lot of gold leaf. This has been a big thing in the last five or 10 years that use gold leaf on these pastries. So that's a lemon tart. Uh, this is like a big macaroon with strawberries in, uh, I'm sorry, raspberries in it. And now I'm gonna let you on on the secret of why French breads and pastry are so good. So hang on to your hats. Uh, so one is in order to be called a boulangerie or a bakery in France officially by the government, you must bake everything on the premises. So that means everything is made fresh daily and the breads, the croissants, the pain de chocolat, those are made every few hours. So they usually have like a schedule. So say at five in the morning, they'll um, bake the first batch of uh, croissants and then at 5.30 they'll make the baguettes and at uh, 6.15 they'll make the pan de So it's a continuous cycle all day long and you're always guaranteed uh, fresh uh, breads. And if you're lucky, you might get a warm baguette and put it under your arm. And the other secret behind the French pastries, why they're so good, is the butter. So the butter fat content in France is a whopping 82%. Uh, it's one of the highest in the world. So that again, it's set by the government. You can't call it butter unless it has 82% butter fat. And so, and the bakers even use a more dense butter that's 99% butter fat, but let's not worry about the calories here. So now I'm very lucky because I live on a main street here. It's called the Rue Saint Antoine. And, uh, and within three blocks, I have every food shop that I could want. So I have three supermarkets, four bakeries, four wine shops, two cheese shops, uh, three fruit and vegetable stands. And only in Paris would you have two foie shops on one street, <laughs> like about 300 feet from one another. And if you don't know what foie is, it is a delicacy. It is a goose liver um, or duck liver pate. And so this shop specializes in um, foie gras and they've won many awards. And uh, now I'm gonna show you. So these, and it comes in different forms. So you can buy it in a can, you can buy it in a jar. And a lot of people, I bring people on my tours to buy this foie gras because it's not that easy to get it back home and it's a lot less expensive and there's, uh, you could travel with it. And then this is, they sell a lot of other products here. These are other kinds of pâtés and everything in the store is made in France, which is really great. And then, um, and then this is a very cool store. So this is called Israel, and this is a Middle Eastern gourmet shop. So here you can see all, they have all these wonderful dried fruits. They have um, mango and um, what, uh, that's uh, papaya. They have kiwi. They're also inside they have um, apricots and they sell absinthe. So, that was, so that's what drove Van Gogh crazy is drinking absinthe. 
And then they have some very exotic products. Look down here, a little hard to see, but they have Aunt Jemima pancake mix imported all the way from the United States and it costs 13 euros. So, all right, then next, uh, now I was a chocolate maker and a chef and a baker when I lived in New York. And so I love showing people the pastries and chocolate of Paris. And so this is a shop just a few doors down from me, which is very dangerous. Uh, and this is called the Atelier du Chocolat, and that means chocolate studio. And one of their specialties is you can see they do these bouquets, they look just like flower bouquets, but they've got chocolate in them. And so now they're preparing for a Valentine's Day like we do in the United States. And this is some of their Valentine's Day treats. And um, now here's my cheese shop. So as you know, there's uh, hundreds of kinds of uh, cheeses in France. And uh, when Charles de Gaulle became president, he said, how could I rule a country that has over 400 kinds of cheeses? So this particular shop is called Laurent Dubois. And this is one of the top cheese shops in Paris. Again, it won an award. You can see that they like giving awards out to uh, food shops in Paris and they age their own cheeses in the um, basement. They have like these cellars where they age their cheeses and they have about a hundred different kinds of cheeses. Uh, they have uh, goat's cheese, sheep's cheese um, and um, cow's, meat, cow's milk cheeses, excuse me. And so here, this is a brie with truffles. Um, these are um, other kinds, this is goat cheese here. And they sell all the classic cheeses too. So they sell um, camembert, uh, brie, um, blue cheese. Uh, and then this is their selection of goat cheeses here. They have about 35 different kinds of goat cheese here. So, and uh, there's the blue cheeses down there. And then that one on top, it looks like a cheddar, but it's not, it's called a mimiolette. And it's actually more the texture of say like Parmesan. Uh, it's very crumbly, so. Okay, now, I love this guy. Look at this guy. Doesn't he look happy? He is dispensing honey. And this is a store called La Famille Marie, and it's a chain of honey shops. So they have about 50 different kinds of flavored honeys here. And so they have uh, from different regions, uh, lots of flavors. So they have um, honey, eucalyptus, lavender, uh, chestnut, uh, truffle. Uh, you can see this is uh, with cranberries in it. And again, these are all within like a three minute walk of my house. So, and then uh, my fruit and vegetable stand. So this is from last summer and they have the most delicious apricots you will ever taste. Uh, you have these donut peaches, the cantaloupes there, fresh watermelon, and look at the cherries, how wonderful they look. And these are the uh, green figs. Those are the uh, rainier cherries. And this is a smoked salmon shop. <laughs> so it's smoked salmon from pretty much uh, Northern Europe and Scandinavia all over. Okay, so now we're gonna go shopping. So now there's this one street, um, just, a, just about a five minute walk from my house and it is called the Rue Louis Pont Philippe. And what's great about this street is that all the um, boutiques on this street are designated by the government uh, or by the city, they can only have handmade or handcrafted merchandise. So these are really great shops. They're individual stores. There's no chain stores. There's no Gap. There's no Nike. And most of the merchandise is either made in France or in Paris. So this is a um, handbag shop, so or leather goods. So Pierre Bosset used to work for Louis Vuitton and then struck it out on his own. And he makes these really nice um, leather purses. He's got um, notebooks here uh, and, some, and even jewelry with leather on it. And then next, this is a jewelry shop called uh, Jocelyn Aubray. And she does this very nice um, costume jewelry, lots of uh, colored stones and um, glass. And then also you see here, she uses um, fabric here. So very original jewelry and not super expensive. Um, you know, you could buy a pair of earrings there for 25 euros, which is 30 American dollars. So not over the top priced. And then here, oh, look, she's a, that's one of our most fashionable women here in Paris. Uh, and then here, now what's really great about this street is they have, three paper and stationary shops on one street. So most cities or towns only have one good stationary store. There's three on one street. And this is one of my favorite ones. This is called Melody Graphique. And they specialize in accessories 
for calligraphy. So you see they have the quill pens there, and then they have the wood ones there, and then um, they have all the other, and then those are the beautiful inks. You see they have like almost 50 colors of ink. See that, calligraphy ink. And then they also sell these nice leather bound journals. And uh, they have a shop next door with more decorative stuff. So look at these really pretty um, boxes, very French. And look at these little cards and notebooks, very neat. And then look at these gorgeous, um, I think those are bookmarks and ribbon there. And last thing, this is the St. Paul Church. And this was the first Jesuit church of Paris built between uh, 1625 and 1640. And, um, and then uh, that's the front entrance there. So it's a mixture of uh, Baroque architecture and Gothic architecture. And, uh, and then this is, uh, they just redid this and they put this beautiful clock in. And then that's the inside there. Uh, notice there's chairs instead of pews. And then that's the altar there. And then that is a rare Delacroix painting that most people don't know about. And it's called Jesus in the Olive Grove. And then one last photo here, um, two last photos. That is a, a 200 foot high dome. And then last but not least, the organ. So that is my tour of the Marais. I hope you liked it. And now I'm ready for your questions. So I'm gonna go to Thank the- you, Richard. We have a, all sorts of wonderful questions coming in. Okay. So I'm just going to dive into a really great um, sweet, okay. a sweet one. Can you talk a little bit about French chocolate and how it might differ from Belgian or Swiss chocolate? Okay, so um, because I was a chocolate maker, I, I, you, you could trust me on the chocolate thing. I used to make chocolate truffles. And um, now French chocolate, especially what they sell in the shops here, the very high end shops is mostly dark. They do very little milk chocolate in France. And um, I'd say they're equal or similar to Belgian chocolate. I, I'm, not a cra I'm not crazy about Swiss chocolate. I find it too bland. And also here in Paris, in the last like 10 years, there's been these uh, really exquisite chocolatiers. These guys are like, artisans and they get, they source the world for different kinds of chocolate, especially dark chocolate. So they go to Africa, they go to South America, even Vietnam now is becoming a big place. And it's almost like wine. They, they'll go into a shop and you'll take a taste and they'll say, this one has like a fruity essence or this one has like a, I don't know, something like that. So it's almost like wine in that sense. Okay. Um, oh, thank you. And, and then we have a couple more. Um, okay really interesting about just the economics of the Marai. I, I know mm -hmm. that 200 square foot house is extremely expensive and people yeah. might be interested to know how expensive, but tell us about these local artisans, these local shops and their rent and how mm -hmm. they make how do, you mind. know, is it expensive to rent there? Um, I think, I believe on that street that they, they, they have um, not, not so much a protection, but I think they have a ceiling on how much, because again, it's designated by, the city and the shops kind of on the more main streets are kind of expensive rents. Um, but you know, it's sometimes a mystery to me because sometimes you see these shops and you go like, how could they survive just selling whatever cheese or this or whatever like that. But a lot of these stores have been here since I moved here. And so um, I believe they do uh, enough business to um, stay in, in business. So um, and then there's, there are some chain stores here, like there is this one main street where it used to be sp small boutique, but now they've gotten priced out. But if you go on the little side streets, there's still a lot of these individual boutiques. No, that's great. And a lot of people are wondering as well, what are the names? So before we repeat some of the names of the shops, I will say, mm -hmm. If you just drop a quick email to fernleyftraveldesign at gmail.com okay. and I'll pop it into the chat, um, okay. we'd be happy to send you the location and the names of all of these shops. But specifically, mm -hmm. people are dying to remember what the name of the boulangerie is, as well as the cheese shop. Do you mind repeating that for us? Uh, not at all. Uh, the cheese shop is called uh, Laurent Dubois, like Blanche Dubois. And they actually have three locations in, in Paris. So there's one in the um, Latin Quarter, and I forget where the other one is. Um, and then the other, the bakery or the boulangerie, now, don't worry, if you don't get to that boulangerie, there's like five of them within like, I don't know, 10 feet of my house. So 
Uh, but anyway, that is called Au Petit de Versailles. And actually what it is, is the um, ceilings are hand painted like the ceilings in Versailles. So that is the name of that. That's amazing. Um, really interesting questions. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about foie gras. Um, the question is from Peggy and she was wondering, I heard that they cannot make foie gras the traditional way. How do they make it now? Uh, I don't think that's true. Um, yeah. Not that I know of. I know in the United States there are restrictions. So I know in, even in certain um, uh, states, uh, like in California, it's, it's banned. You can't serve it at all. But as far as I know, they still use the same techniques. And how about uh, the Mariah's a Jewish neighborhood? Do you mind yes. enlightening us um, a little bit about that? Sure, yeah, absolutely. And I'm sorry, I didn't get time to that. Uh, <laughs> we only had an hour. Uh, so the Marais was primarily a Jewish area in between the 1900s and the 1960s. And actually the, um, the Shoah Memorial is also in this neighborhood, which is the Holocaust Museum. So unfortunately, um, many of the um, Jewish people that live in the neighborhood uh, were sent to the concentration camps. And um, there's uh, signs on the schools here in the neighborhood where they deported the children. So you'll see those uh, about a half a dozen of the schools here. And um, there's, there's a street called the Rue des Rosiers, uh, which is most of the Jewish population dispersed from the Marais in the 60s and 70s. But there's still this one street called the uh, Rue de Rosier, and they have all these Jewish um, food shops on there. So they have all these great falafel shops, they have a Jewish deli, they have uh, even a Jewish butcher where you can get kosher fagwa. <laughs> and that's a really popular street. So um, you go on there um, on a Sunday afternoon, you can even walk in that street because there's this one famous falafel place that's supposedly the best falafel in the world. Um, but uh, anyway, that's it. so that is the story a little bit of the Jewish neighborhood here. That's fantastic. Um, a lot of questions about the art, uh, the Picasso Museum, the visual sound, Van Gogh. Do you include some of those when you go around the Marais? Um, I don't personally take people inside the museums, um, but I point them out to them, tell them a little bit history about them. So you have about a half a dozen uh, museums here. And there's a, you obviously have the uh, Picasso, which was uh, reopened about two years ago, and they had doubled the um, interior space. So now there's a lot more hanging in there. And the Carnavalet Museum, which I showed you before, uh, is reopening this year. So they were closed for three years for a complete um, renovation. And so, and that's a great museum. It's all about the history of Paris, that museum. And so I really like that museum a lot. It's one of my favorites in the area. And then you also have um, on the Place de Vosges, I forgot to mention, there's a Victor Hugo Museum. So Victor Hugo actually lived on the Place de Vosges and it's partly where he wrote Les Miserables. And it's now a free museum and you could see his writing desk and his apartment. And, um, and then there's a few other small museums here and also the Pompidou is technically in the Marais, but unfortunately in 2022, um, they're gonna close that for four years for renovation. So you all need to get here before then so they don't close because it's such a great museum. It's the second most visited museum in Paris. And you know, a lot of people are having conversations about going to the Marais. I think we can all agree that taking a tour in the morning allows Richard to show you the best and in inner parts of the area, but then also show you where you can pop into these local shops for some lunch and then spend an afternoon truly visiting some of these smaller museums that I happen to think is the best way to go around Paris. I prefer the smaller museums over the big ones. Yeah, um, I always and, tell people there's, there's such, you know, great art besides the Louvre and all these other places. Exactly. And, um, you know, the other thing about the Marais is, you know, I, I've had um, clients stay in the Marais and they spend, uh, sometimes they'll spend almost their whole trip here. They, 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 they said, we had all these other things to do, but the Marais was so cool and so interesting. And, you know, it's also really large. So on my tour, which is three hours, I usually just do maybe a quarter of the Marais because it's, you know, there's so much to see and do here. And sometimes I do full day tours of the Marais to show you the other parts of it. 
So tell us more how to be informed travelers. One of the questions we have is when visiting a boulangerie or other food shops, mm -hmm. are there any customs, customs that should be observed when placing an order? Well, let's see. Have, have you, any of you watched Emily in Paris? <laughs> Preferably not that way, but yes. <laughs> okay. Anyway, there's a very funny scene when she goes into the uh, boulangerie. Uh, well, the one thing, this is where pretty much anywhere you go is you always have to say bonjour. Even in, if you don't buy anything, even if you're just looking, you have to greet the person there and say bonjour to them. It's sort of like when you were kids, you were always, you were always told to say please and thank you. Here it's, you, you say bonjour. And, um, and then usually, um, no other really food rules, not that I can really um, think of. I mean, sometimes you have to be a little bit patient because <laughs> there's always a line in most of these places. And so um, I think that's pretty much it. I really can't think of anything else. I mean, I know there's some things I could tell you about restaurants, like you don't tip in restaurants here. So basically your tip is included. It's called the service charge. So you don't have to leave 15 or 20%. And this is a big mistake people make. They, you know, they'll go to a fancy restaurant, leave 20% and going, oh my gosh, you could have bought another pair of shoes with that money. Um, and so, uh, but it is customary sometimes to leave a little bit of money on the table. So say you went for lunch and it was 40 euros. So you would just leave a two euro coin on the table just as a courtesy. And even if you don't have any change on you, um, it's perfectly fine not to leave a tip at all. So that's just one of the things. Yeah, exactly. And I love the fact that you brought up staying in the Marais as well. There is a beautiful hotel on the Place de Vosges or within the Place de Vosges um, that's well worth looking at. Uh, just these small boutique places that you can hmm. stay. Yeah. Um, actually, Rhonda would like to know a little bit more about you, Richard, if you don't oh. mind sharing with us. Um, what made you move to Paris? How long have you been there? How have okay. you seen it change? Okay, so uh, I moved for the pastries. Well, sort of, it's half true. Uh, no, I've, uh, I came, my first trip to Paris when I was 20 years old in the late 1970s, and I fell madly in love, and I said, I am going to live in Paris one day. I don't know when, I don't know how, and finally, about 35 years later, <laughs> I made it come true. So I moved here in 2005 with my long-term partner, and uh, we moved to the Marais, and we found this great apartment here, and... Um, so now it's been 16 years that I'm here and I started my blog in 2006. So it's 15 years old now. And then I started my tours in 2007. So that is a little bit of my story there, but I can tell you much more, but we don't have that much time. <laughs> oh, I hear you. Yeah. Now Ellen um, brought up, it's really interesting that yeah. there are some new malls coming into the area with some modern stores. Are you seeing Lots of locals get into the mall scene in Paris. Are things changing from a more uh, local perspective to a more what we'd call commercial or mainstream mall? There's not really so much of a mall culture, culture here. There is a big mall that they opened up um, in a more residential area of Paris, but I wouldn't say it's it's I wouldn't say it's a trend here. Um, you do have um, sometimes like there's this courtyard where they have all these food shops, something like that. But that's pretty much what you'll see here. And there are some big brands that, you know, you'll see all over. So there's a fashion line called M-A-J-E, you might've heard of it. And they have like a, they're almost like Gap. They have a store, oh, they're not as, they're a lot more expensive than the Gap, but they have a lot of shops. So you see a little bit of this more commercialization uh, of, of Paris, so. No, I agree. And I think we yeah. have, I'm just checking to see if we're answering all of the questions as they come in. Lots of questions about where you can see this afterwards because it's been so informative. I will say that the Mark Twain Library has a phenomenal YouTube page. Maybe give us about 48 hours to get it up if you don't mind, but we will let you know when it is up and you can view it always under Travel Dreaming. Mm -hmm. um, we will also give you a few more details about how to get in touch with uh, Richard, of course. But there's a few more questions in terms of the Victor Hugo house um, mm -hmm. or Le Al, um, mm -hmm. in terms of food markets. So do you mind okay. taking a minute yeah. on both of those for us? I'm here for you guys. <laughs> I'm home, I'm not going anywhere. You know, I can't go out and party. There's a six o'clock, what do you call it? Curfew, Curf yeah. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Um, so just in terms of, can you talk a little bit more about the Victor Hugo house in the Place de Vosges? 
Okay, so the um, Victor Hugo House, like I said before, is now a museum and they actually have um, some first editions of his books. And um, he lived there, uh, he moved there after he wrote The Hunchback of Notre Dame. So that was a best-selling book. So now he could afford to live on that square. And, but he self-exiled himself for a number of years because of the politics in France. So he left that house and moved to, I can't remember, it's one of those islands off of Brittany or Normandy, the English Channel Islands, I forget which ones. And so Victor Hugo was also very political. And so, and I'll tell you one fun fact about Victor Hugo. So the reason why he wrote The Hunchback of Notre Dame was that after the revolution, the, they had destroyed the, um, not destroyed, but they um, ransacked Notre Dame. So basically they broke all the, a lot of the windows. They took out anything that was of value like gold, silver, and they just left it in very bad condition. And, um, and so after the um, revolution was over, the city was really poor and they didn't have money to rebuild it. And this infuriated Victor Hugo. So the reason why he wrote The Hunchback of Notre Dame, it was sort of like a love letter slash shame letter to the city. And so the book became so popular and people started to fall in love with Notre Dame again that uh, they started to rebuild it in 1845 and um, they completely restored it to its original um, splendor. So. No, I'm so glad that we we're going to take two more questions and then move forward. But uh, from Nancy, she okay. was wondering, uh, as a local, do you have any favorite restaurants in the Marai that you said, that's it, we can't go unless we travel to these restaurants and eat? Okay, um, boy, it's, it, that's, that's a hard one because there's um, a lot of- Like them. asking which is the best Italian in New York City. <laughs> right, exactly. What's the best pizza? Anyway. Um, okay, so one of the restaurants that I really like here, and it's more modern French food, and it is called Les Foodies, F-O-O-D-I-E-S. And then there's, um, oh, and the other one that I really like a lot, uh, and this is a little more traditional French food, it's called Le Petit Marché. I've and then there. one other, uh, it is called Chez Janou, J-A-N-O-U. And um, that's very classic French food, really fun place. They've got old movie posters, French movie posters on it, very lively. And they make the most amazing chocolate mousse. So they bring it out in this huge, like family size bowl and they plop it in front of you with a big spoon and you could take as much as you want. Talk about dangerous. <laughs> It's amazing. And yeah. then finally, Barbara, I know we are all dying to get to Paris. Today, of course, is not about selling the destination. It's about dreaming of when we will be going again. Mm -hmm. However, yes, um, just to talk a little briefly about uh, some COVID restrictions that are in place. Okay. Um, Paris has certainly, I'll, I'll let Richard talk, Paris has certainly very stringent restrictions right now. Okay, um, so we have a um, six o'clock curfew. Um, everybody has to wear masks outside now. Um, and uh, the restaurants and cafes are not open. The, the shops are open, uh, but restaurants and cafes are, are not open, but some of them have takeout service. So whatever, you can get uh, things to go from there. Uh, museums are still closed, theaters, things like that. Uh, I don't know when they're going to open again. Uh, we're getting the vaccine. It was slow for a while, but now they're really speeding it up. And so again, I think it's just going to, like everywhere else, I just think it's going to depend how much of the um, vaccine gets, um, you know, to people. Exactly. Yeah. And likewise, of course, for you United States citizens, depending on where you are a citizen from, but currently there's no leisure travel going in or out of the country. Right. Yeah. Um, I would say yeah, no regardless of how you're planning, do plan with a travel advisor as these things are changing right. um, almost constantly. Uh, yeah. Richard and I had a, a conversation. We thought this question might come up. And if we were the all knowing eye seers through the crystal ball, um, both of us feel really comfortable about planning fall forward, fall of 2021, moving yes. forward. Mm -hmm. um, again, so many things could change and right. we keep up to date on those, but our hopes and our dreams 
are in there that we can safely travel once again as people do um, receive vaccinations and we get some control of variants and things mm. like that. Um, I do want to mention, just as we are wrapping up here, that we have taken loads of questions and comments. We do appreciate them. We're happy to answer any more, but we are very conscious of time and staying in that kind of hour bracket. Um, but Richard, what I love, and I'm going to ask you to talk about this for two seconds, is that because, of course, we are a learning institution and we love to talk about books and talk about destinations, he has a book of the month club. And the next one is actually going to be the Paris Library. So Richard, tell us more about this book that is just coming out. So this is really exciting. So every month I choose a different book about Paris or France for my book club. And this book was supposed to come out last year. And it's based on a true story about a woman who works in the American library in, in Paris. And um, I know the author, she's a, a friend of mine, and it was supposed to come out last uh, June. And of course it was delayed by COVID, but the funny thing was, was that it was released in all these other countries. So uh, I was looking at Janet's uh, Facebook page and she said, oh, it's gotten great reviews in Romania and oh, they love it in Italy or, you know, it's a best-selling book in France. So, uh, and I started to read it and it's, it's, it's really wonderful. Um, and I'm doing, a, I don't mean to plug, but I'm uh, on my blog on Tuesday, I'm gonna feature it as the book club and you could win a free copy of the book. So. Uh, I would also like to remind folks that um, Richard has been very, very, very generous. And if you would like to uh, subscribe to his blog and plan on taking his services, he'll give you a 10% discount next time you make those services there in Paris. So we yeah. do appreciate that. But actually, I say, don't worry about the discount. Go to the blog because it is wickedly interesting. He is constantly talking about the new and different things that are out there as well as uh, the mm -hmm. restaurants, what's happening, what's not happening, what's going on, what do we need to know, um, as Paris is forever changing, just like any major city in the world. Yes. Um, but and, with uh, that, I uh, will royally uh, say- One other thing, there's also a subscription box. You'll see it on when you go on the blog on the oh, thank right you. Hand side, you just type in your whatever email and that's that, so. No, thank you. And I can't mm -hmm. thank Richard enough for spending his evening with us. Um, and thank you so much for everyone who has joined us we will continue this series and certainly you can find all of the details on the Mark Twain Library website. It is going to be updated on an ongoing basis. So coming up from February to May, there's a lot between America and New Zealand, Australia, Japan, South Africa, and then for many of you who love the films of Francis Ford Coppola, the story of how he became a hotelier and did not plan on being an owner of hotels or someone within the travel industry, but he's called the accidental hotelier. So we do appreciate everything um, that Richard has brought to the table today. We do appreciate your time. For those of you who are new to the Mark Twain Library, thank you for joining us for the first time. For those of you who have come back to join us again, we greatly appreciate your time and look forward to seeing you at another event. Until then, au revoir. Au revoir. Merci beaucoup. Okay. Have a great day. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye.